Good afternoon and thank you and welcome to everybody for this webinar on how do managers find new knowledge and what is the role of change agents in helping clients achieve their strategic objectives. We've got a fantastically wide uh, variety of all in our audience today so I'm delighted to welcome you to Oxford. Uh, it's a bit of a rainy Oxford today but I hope you'll brighten up later and I hope that you're all well wherever you are around the world. Um, our webinar today is hosted by Sue Dobson which is our faculty dean at the Said Business School and the webinar webinar is from the Co Consulting and Coaching for Change programme, which is a partnership programme between the Said Business School at the University of Oxford and HEC in Paris. Um, the run through for the webinar today, just a bit of housekeeping to make sure everybody knows what's happening and when. Uh, we're going to be um, joined by Sue in a couple of moments and then we're going to have um, some comments from Andy Faulkner, who's the Business Development Manager from the programme. And then uh, we'll be joined by Elizabeth Howard, who is um, an Emeritus Fellow here at the school, but also um, the Honourable Secretary of the Change Leaders Group. And then very kindly, we're joined by John Freeman and Leslie Hilton, who are alumni from the programme and also uh, members of the Consulting for Change Group as well. So very varied group of people, all experienced experts in their field. So it should be a really exciting and engaging conversation today. Um, if you would like to ask questions, and please do ask questions, and we'll be able to fill those either mid-conversation if they're um, relevant to a particular point that we're discussing, or at the end of the webinar when we can uh, take questions and answers. You can ask your questions uh, by typing them into the question box on the right-hand side of the panel. Again, if you have any problems hearing us at all or any concerns, then just type that into the question box and I can help you with that as we go through the webinar. Um, everybody is on mute, so just to make sure we've got good sound quality and you can all hear the um, panellists and the speakers today, but you will have a chance to ask questions, as I say, by the written box on the right-hand side. So without further ado, I'm going to be passing to Andy Faulkner, um, who's going to tell you a bit more about the programme. Hello, Andy. Thank you. Hello. Thank you, Gemma. Yes, uh, thank you to everybody for attending, um, and we hope you find the, uh, the session informative and as it sparks far more questions and research for you all. So as Gemma mentioned, I'm the Business Development Manager here at Side Business School for the Consulting and Coaching for Change program. Uh, as Gemma also mentioned, it's a partnership program that we run in conjunction with HEC in Paris. Um, the, the program is, is designed for um, people involved in change delivery, change agents, change practitioners, um, very, very much focused on the kind of social, psychological, managerial and leadership elements of change. Um, and how to manage and ensure those processes are, are successful and lasting. Um, the, the program in its entirety runs for about 16 months um, and is delivered in a modular format. So of the six modules um, leading up to the final seventh, three are run here in Oxford at Said and three are run uh, in Paris at HEC. Uh, the final seventh module, which is the, the kind of culmination of the program, um, is again also run in Paris. Um, the, the next start date for the program, which will be, I'll be shown towards the end of the webinar, um, is in this coming December, 8th of December 2015. Um, and should you wish to learn more about the program, there will be contact details towards the end of the webinar for both myself and for Anders, um, who is a member in Paris who also deals with the program. So again, thank you all for attending. Um, I truly hope that you enjoy the content of the webinar. Um, and any further questions for, around the program itself, um, I'd be more than happy to field towards the end of the webinar. So I'll hand over now again to, to Sue Dobson. Right. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, great pleasure to be joining this webinar, um, partly because it's about a subject that I feel very passionate about and do research in, but also I have the privilege to be a tutor on uh, the CCC program as well. So uh, very, very uh, looking forward to this particular conversation. Um, but my job really is initially to talk to you a bit about a project that uh, myself and colleagues have been involved in, which really began to uh, seek to explore the circumstances under which leaders um, actually access and use management knowledge in their decision making and in their change practice. And I won't bore you with the methodological details of all of that, but essentially the program of research had three phases. The first one involved really quite deep conversations for about a couple of hours with leaders who were interested in management knowledge. You know, they, they, they were active in the educational, executive education world, they'd taken further degrees. Um, and we were really looking at 
their careers, perspectives, their motivations to seek management knowledge over time. So that's quite an in-depth exploration of people's motivations to learn uh, and what's, what stopped them learning as well. The, the second phase was really looking at, um, in particular sites, what management knowledge or frameworks were used and adopted and what were the effects of that so why was it that certain models you know really landed in certain change contexts and were used and what were discarded and, and what did we learn about the process of adoption there and the third phase was was very experimental it began to look at action learning sets and many of you have been may have been involved in action learning sets or know about them but these are essentially small group spaces to have conversations about leadership issues and practices and they've rarely been looked at as forums for for learning and we were keen to explore what we could learn from exploring that particular intervention so maybe if i can just now turn very briefly to some of the you know the headlines that, that are coming out of those three phases of work um, i suppose the first one really was from this first phase where we were looking at uh, what really influenced uh, leaders in, in terms of using you know, research? Uh, what was the role of research relative to other sources of knowledge that they might have on their management and leadership practice? And you'll see a, a, a rather busy graph there, which um, essentially reveals that what we found very strongly amongst leaders was that orientation was to knowledge that was based on experience and also knowledge that they drew from their um, interactions and involvement in their own communities of practice. And sadly for me as a, an academic who pumps out uh, you know, research um, articles and, uh, and, and books, uh, what we find is that very rarely uh, do uh, leaders search for and use academic articles. It really is a case of uh, focusing and reflecting on their experience and their communities of practice and that became the most incredibly important uh, influence on the way in which they got knowledge and they, the way they thought about the what knowledge and the way they used about knowledge, uh, knowledge as well so you'll see there that personal experience community of practice then training and research experience um, were the, the three most dominant uh, themes and essentially research present publications etc were, were, were less relevant um, but let's move a little bit about um, what did we learn about the experiences or the processes of uh, knowledge acquisition and what we found was that um, leaders and managers were provoked to uh, access new sources of knowledge or experiences when they were confronted with a puzzle or a challenge in their organizational context that their current experience and knowledge base simply couldn't help them with. So it was, this, it was this puzzle and challenge that provoked them to think, I need something different and new. And I think that's an interesting issue, is to, to, to think about what are the, the puzzles uh, and the challenges that are confronting us in our leadership work. And, and often we find that what we uh, typically draw on isn't good enough to help us with that challenge. And I think that's an interesting process to explore. I think the second thing that came out very strongly was the importance of our our own history, our own career history, our own personal history. We found that biographical dimensions were very important in shaping people's orientation to knowledge. Um, I've got a lovely quote here, which isn't on, on the slide there, but let me let me let me just uh, share that with you. This was from a, a leader who was really fascinated with understanding what the academic community is thinking. And he said, look, a lot of people could say that I'm an academic with a chalk up my nose. That's not the answer. The answer is that I came from a poor background. And if I try to take shortcuts when talking with people smarter than me, I always look stupid. And I said, enough is enough. I'm not going to go through life like that looking stupid. So his engagement with academic work and management knowledge was from that deep feeling of feeling in the playground or feeling uncomfortable and feeling stupid. So again, that begins to uh, highlight the importance of perhaps us as leaders engaging more carefully with our own biographical history of learning and understanding how that shapes our orientation to knowledge. And I think the other thing uh, that came 
came out um, is, is while I've said you know academic uh, articles were not hugely important in people's lives I have to say that the text that synthesized and filtered knowledge like the Harvard Business Review and you know that 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 wonderful book that synthesizes things was very useful so uh, you know the role of synthesis and maybe that's something the academic community needs to do more of is to try and synthesize knowledge that, that, that that's out there um, if, if I just turn a little bit about what management knowledge should we find was actually used more in, in a change agency sense, interestingly in the sites that we were looking at, there was a very wide um, range of formal knowledge, but actually it clustered in two areas, performance management, yeah, people wanted to, to knowledge was flowing around that helped people think about performance management, quality improvement and organisational change. And uh, what we find with, with knowledge leaders who are change agents in uh, our, the context that we were studying, they drew on texts to really make progress on this local puzzle, puzzle. and they tested out the, the evidence base of knowledge in, in context, and they were re-evaluating that knowledge, so it's a much messier process. And what we found in that process is that change agents, or knowledge leaders as I put it here, weren't involved in a rational process of translation. Now, here is the idea, I'm going to translate it into practice in a very rational way. Instead, what they were doing, they were transposing knowledge. They were manipulating it. They were massaging it. They were using it for their own local ends to try and persuade people in their local context that this was, the change was needed. So we get a much messier process that I've called transposition rather than translation, which involves altering, repositioning, exchanging into some kind of register of practice that lands in the context which enables them to make progress. I guess the um, other theme that I just wanted to, to talk about was, was recognizing uh, the importance of how groups think and you know, the way they've been trained and, and the knowledge that they feel comfortable with. One of the sites that we, we looked at was a, a mental health uh, site and also a, a, a primary care site. And the, the, the kind of knowledge that was landing in that world was systems thinking. Because mental health, those of you that have, have, have been involved in mental health settings or primary care settings will know that you know, the systems thinking complexity is part of the way in which uh, clinicians in mental health are trained, general practitioners are trained. That kind of systems thinking landed well with that group. It did not land well with groups who were more professional, like surgeons, for example, who were trained in a particular way. So I think the point there is that we also need to understand um, what groups feel comfortable with in terms of knowledge, what makes sense to them, and the importance of these epistemic communities of practice uh, where things feel comfortable um, and they fly because it, it, it feels um, that something that they've valued in their own professional training. Um, another point I want to talk about, uh, what came up very, very strongly, I'm going to link this to the action learning sets, uh, is the importance of finding spaces for reflections to, uh, for people to reflect and engage uh, and appreciate other uh, different perspectives. Um, and where change happened, you found knowledge leaders who were skilled at recognizing the importance of finding spaces to exchange conversations and who were also clever at convening conversations with people who needed to be in the room. So again, learning happened when you got these formative spaces and people who cared enough about um, protecting those spaces for others to learn. If I can say a little bit about action learning sets, um, these are one of the few organizational forums where people can learn about knowledge from other disciplines. And in our research, they prove to be very important sites for intermixing you know, this more codified knowledge, management knowledge, but also experiential uh, knowledge and interpersonal knowledge. And they prove to be a rather successful way of assisting you know, busy leaders uh, learning and, and, and moving change. And um, if I can just really begin to uh, pull out uh, some of the themes from the action learning sets, because I think 
it did for us reveal how adults develop and utilize knowledge in management practice. And what we found there was that people involved in action learning set activated knowledge search activities when they were faced with work issues which incorporated personal elements and, and challenged their sense of identity. So one component of learning that we found was also centered on the care of self. Um, career transition stages were also important in activating individuals to search for knowledge. So when you're about to start a new job um, or a developmental task, that often provoked a search for further knowledge, um, not just within a known discipline, but maybe a, dis a different discipline as well. And what we also found was, again, like I mentioned earlier, that the, the, no robust evidence from one form of management knowledge was considered more credible than another. Alongside published research, people talked about experiential knowledge as well. Um, and again, this messiness of how people learn was evident in this action learning set. Um, we found that assembling ideas and knowledge and situating it within an organization is a recursive process which involves multiple iterations. And the final diagram, which again is a very, very busy diagram, uh, begins to uh, try and map out this kind of process that we found of assembling uh, relevant knowledge ideas and then situating it within an organization. Um, and this, this notion of assessing and trialing ideas and reflection and so forth. So the debates within an action learning set facilitated the same process of transposition that I mentioned earlier, where knowledge leaders took management knowledge and shaped it within practice to get things done. We saw the same transposition processes happening in action learning sets. So one contribution that we're trying to make in this research um, suggests that within a context, um, the motivation and orientation to learn and share knowledge is an important and neglected dimension of learning. Um, and in, 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 in some senses, what we're looking here uh, in the slide is trying to map the kind of learning process that we saw in the action learning set, but also within the, 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 the general research itself. So my final point here is that the knowledge mobilization process that we witness for each individual is an adaptive testing and embedding process. It involves uh, stages of connecting, by which I mean the initiation for knowledge seeking is frequently personal. Individuals may explore ideas, be attracted to a context, concept, may reflect on an experience or seek a problem to solve that's very personal. But there's also this assembling process, and this involves the co-evolution of learning uh, and the dynamics of organizational life. Um, so reflective practitioners find it hard to do this alone, and the collective sharing element in an action learning set or in a formative space is helpful. There's also this situating process as well that, I, that um, we refer to on the slide here. And this involves political processes, stakeholder assessment, and garnering support. This is the meat of change agency. Um, and in some way, that becomes very important in terms of assessing the, the context and trying to make the context receptive for knowledge to land. And then finally, this transposing process, which I've hinted at as being very messy, uh, the notion of taking knowledge, but also um, shaping it and massaging it. And that's a struggle, a, a negotiation, uh, a messy process which takes time. So I've probably said uh, enough now uh, about some of the highlights of a very kind of complicated concept of uh, what provokes leaders to want to seek knowledge, what knowledge flies. And when they've got knowledge, how do they process that, as well as highlighting the importance of these formative spaces, and in particular, action learning sets. So now I'm going to uh, hand over to uh, Elizabeth, who, again, uh, has been a colleague on CCC for many years, but uh, helps shape a very important community of practice for the CCC program. Elizabeth. Bear with me. 
Hello, Elizabeth. Hello, hello everybody. I'm, I'm delighted to join this seminar and as Sue said, I've been involved with the CCC program um, for, uh, for many years, but uh, what really um, uh, uh, interests me at the moment is that I, I am now the secretary of the community of practice which has grown out of CCC uh, and this I think is an extraordinary um, organization and um, um, one which demonstrates I think the, the value of learning in some of the ways that Sue's been talking about. But actually, before I introduce um, some other members of this community of practice, um, I've got a couple of questions for you, Sue, if, if you wouldn't mind. Yes. Um, and I suppose what, one is, you were talking about this messy process yes. of transposing knowledge yes. rather than translating it. Um, that sounds slightly worrying to me. It sounds almost as if no, the knowledge is being uh, traduced, changed, um, uh, and might not be really uh, what the, the originators of yeah. some concept yeah. um, hoped for. Yeah. Um, can you give an example um, of, of this going on that might reassure me that things don't get, it's not like Chinese whispers and that... No, uh, no, I, I didn't mean to give that impression. No, 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 it, it's not about completely uh, dismissing the source uh, of it. So, for example, um, uh, I'll give you two examples, really. I mean, what, one was the old balanced scorecard, right? Kaplan and oh, yes. can't remember his last name, but uh, which is very bad of me. But you know, the balanced scorecard um, in one of our sites was 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 very important, but it was used um, in, in the following way. It was the, the the integrity of the insight was there, but the knowledge leader was skillful at translating it into a language that the receivers of that knowledge felt more comfortable with. Okay, so one isn't one isn't take one isn't kind of ignoring the the, the ideas. It's about making sure that. Uh, it is received by the audience in a way that chimes with them and helps them use it as they themselves seek to influence their own communities of practice. Does that make sense? Yeah, so, yes. so the integrity is there, but it's it it it, it, it but it but it but it is, and it's also shaped to the to the puzzle in hand. So. The knowledge leaders use stories about this is going to help you with this problem. So in a way, the messiness is around utilizing or helping people understand how the knowledge can help them in their own puzzles and in their own practice. Yeah, well, yeah, that's that's reassuring, I suppose, and 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 helpful because I think that's um, uh, the first time I have seen anything. Uh, your last slide, yeah. which explains um, to me yeah. this this very messy process of trans transposing knowledge Absolutely. into organisations. Absolutely, from, and, and, and to be very clear as well, I mean the academic text, yeah, that this came from, and the legitimacy that he had in the outside world was very useful in terms of allowing the change leaders to start the conversation off, yeah, as well. Yes. So, uh, so I the, the the text, and you don't see this very much um, written about actually people. You know, the, the text itself was also very important in embedding the learning process. Yeah, 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 I understand. Well, um, there are so many things that you are raising there, and one, of course, is the importance of communities of practice. Yeah. And there is a community of practice which has grown out of the Consulting um, Coaching for Change program, um, which we call the Change Leaders. Uh, which many mem uh, many alumni from the program have joined, and they continue to learn, uh, to research, uh, to share their knowledge, uh, to develop new knowledge amongst themselves. And I think we've got several members um, of the group online at the moment, mm -hmm. uh, but we have some who, who who'd like to make a particular contribution to our seminar um, uh, this afternoon. Uh, the, the first is uh, is John Freeman, and I would just like to to pass over to John for his thoughts and reflections on what he's been hearing uh, and what he'd like to say about this subject. So, hello, John. Can you hear me? John, bear with me just a moment. Hello, John. You should be able to hear us now. I can hear. I can hear you perfectly. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, I'm, hello, I'm John hello, John. It's, um, it's it's lovely to hear your voice, John. And I'm looking forward to what you have to say. 
Super. Well, a, a few reflections, but um, an introduction uh, uh, first of all. Um, I live now a glorious portfolio lifestyle, which I put down to the Consulting for Change uh, program, um, which has enabled me to follow a pathway, which has led me from what I was, which was the European HR director with a US health company based in Paris, um, into my own business in executive coaching and coach training, but also the direction I'm going in, which is towards non-executive director roles. And I actually sit on two boards. One, I'm the finance director with the International Coaching Federation, and I also have a marketing role with a, with a cinema group. Uh, I was a founder member, and for four years I was chair of the Change Leaders Limited, which is the community of practice that Elizabeth has, has referred to. And we do indeed call ourselves a community of practice rather than an, an alumni group, but we have taken over the role of being the alumni group for the program as well. And why is it a community of practice and what's remarkable about, about that is, first of all, it's self-organized. Um, but secondly, that it remains active, um, not just in terms of learning, but also in terms of sharing business between members. And this is after 12 cohorts have passed through the program, and we have members from every single cohort. Um, so on to the, the research. Um, uh, I'd like to thank Sue for inviting me to, to comment on this, both from a practitioner perspective um, and from a change agent uh, point of view. And, and I'll just pick out a few isolated points that, uh, that, 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 that struck me. Um, uh, music to my ears, of course, as an executive coach, to be talking about space for reflection and care of self. That's just what we as executive coaches uh, aim to deliver and provide for people who can't necessarily find it in the, in the day to day. And again, um, uh, how to do that from experiencing reflective practice through the CCC program and then enabling others to do it has been a major change in my life. And, and it was a change when I was um, uh, working operationally as well as when I'm practicing um, in, in, individually. Um, I'm also struck by the, the change agent role in making research uh, accessible, this notion of transposing. And there was one comment that I read in the, in, the, in the research, one of the interviews where somebody talked about a political buzz around things. And I related to that. It's my experience um, as a leadership development um, professional that getting people talking about an issue Having the word out in the business is the first step to get interest in a new knowledge or, or skill area. Um, I also relate strongly to this need for uh, that managers are saying for practical value. Yeah. And I remember one of my challenges as an HR director was often as basic as getting people to turn up to programs that people would sign up but not, not show up. Um, uh, and I noticed this need for pragmatic value as well. Um, now in my role with the, the International Coach Federation, and just to give an example, um, we have the International Coach Federation in London has an event next week on the 19th with Matthew Taylor, who's the CEO of the Royal Society of the Arts, the keynote, so an absolute um, uh, leading research organization in the UK. Um, but what I notice um, as the finance director is that our ticket sales spike each time we put out a kind of what's in it for you communication, when we say there'll be practical tips, when we say there'll be lots of ideas. Um, so that was a plug for our, our event. Do take a look at the UK ICF website if you're interested in big change in that area. Um, but what I might, might, might take this on to is saying the change agent's role, whether you're selling a conference or whether you're communicating an idea, is making what can appear to be an impenetrable world um, and language of academics accessible. And I'd also say that from, from, from CCC, that um, like pre-CCC I, CCC, I would have been um, put off and baffled by words like epistemic. Yes. And now I can look at uh, Sue's research and say, ah, yeah, I can see the methodology, I can see the thread, I can see the flow. And now that's helping me to, me to understand. Um, but onto this point about uh, managers transposing research knowledge into experience-based practice. Um, 
and there's a personal reflection here, and it comes down to my best boss. I think we all have a best boss somewhere in our lives, and uh, and it absolutely put the finger on, on what he could do. And I'm just wondering if it's if it's because it was a world where there were scientists and there were managers, and he as a PhD was able to bring the world to the scientist and uh, uh, a scientist who tended to be a PhD as well, and the manager who tended to be an MBA and bring those those together. Um, and perhaps that leads leads me into the um, the NHS context for Sue's research, and I don't know the NHS uh, at, at all, um, but of course CCC has given me a good network, so to, to get a better feel for it, I was able to speak with um, someone who's a former clinical director in the N NHS and the chair of cardiology at Glasgow University. Now, I won't share his views, but it's simply to, to illustrate that the, the network out there um, uh, has given me a dimension to be able to to, to look at things in a, in, a, in a different way. And much of what he was talking about was about the context of the NHS uh, with the clinicians who tend to be more academically trained uh, and the managers who sometimes are in two different worlds and the challenge of bridging the gap uh, between the two. Um, so uh, with those few uh, reflections, um, I'll, I'll, I'll pass back to you, uh, uh, Elizabeth. Well, uh, that's that's great, John, and and uh, I think uh, us academics, we we hear time and time again that that uh, that that new knowledge and academic knowledge needs to be um, that something needs to happen to it in between it being uh, being generated and being applied, uh, and all well, these transposition processes are extremely important. So your comments on that, I think, are are are, are very worthwhile. But I'm just looking at your slide. Um, You've put up something here about disruption. You, you've been talking about transposing knowledge into practice. But then on the end of the slide, it says you have some reflections on disruption, on personal cost, and disrupted relationships. What were you thinking about there? I think I'm going to throw that back to um, back back to Sue because um, I was looking to see if we had time to cover this this point. But this is this is an example where. Um, uh, this came up in the research, yeah. and um, I was really interested uh, in what Sue uh, meant by that, and um, uh, and perhaps to uh, to help transpose that for me, if you like. Uh, so. <laughs> I, I think the, the the interesting thing is that the, the, these knowledge leaders that we found, these change agents, and uh, of, of which you are one, um, uh, you know, very much had to take some were very brave. Um, in really beginning to try and intervene in getting this knowledge into practice. So uh, when you're doing this kind of work where you're trying to use knowledge to, to really get significant change, A, it's very hard work. So B, it has a personal, you know, often it's it's on top of the day job or it's, it depends, you know, it, it really is, uh, it takes time, thought, but it also involves you uh, provoking and, 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 and trying to get people who, uh, you work with, you have relationships with, to do things very differently. And when you're doing this knowledge uh, transposition work, uh, it can be disruptive of relationships because you're essentially asking people to do things very differently. So I think that's what that was what we we found that um, you know really engaging and getting this knowledge into practice is hard work. Um, can sometimes have personal costs and certainly can challenge relationships that have been relatively harmonious. So uh, it's again something that you need to anticipate if you're taking this kind of work on. And I suspect that John, in your own um, change agency practice, you probably recognise that. Well, absolutely, and, and 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 particularly in working across cultures, which was my thought that came yeah. came out from here. That um, particularly where there is a where there, where there is a program. Um, and there are some themes of the program, and you then have to make those work in India or China or even um, Italy or or Spain. Um, there's a there's a particular a particular challenge, and quite often barriers, um, uh, uh, either of um, not invented here um, or, or or not relevant to us, or we're doing this anyway, um, that make it a lot of work. In order to um, make some particular change initiative part of the culture of the organisation, mm -hmm. rather than 
an isolated program or an isolated uh, training course. Um, and that was my that was my thought there. Really? Yes, yeah. and and of course, uh, uh, just re reflecting on on other issues about the personal cost. Uh, John, you were one of the people who one of the first people to undertake the CCC program, um, and it is a big investment of time and thought and energy. Um, I'm try just trying to remember. It is uh, a while ago. What you um, wrote your own dissertation on? Um, do you? Would you would you mind saying something about that? Um, was it something that was relevant to to this this particular discussion, or did you work on something quite different? Yeah, well, I was um, I, I was uh, I was one of the uh, probably the minority of people at that time who were working in an organisation. I think there've been more participants from within organisations at the time. Um, oh yes, indeed, so, yes, it's a big um, mixture now. I had to bridge giving some value back to my organization as well as oh, to, wow. the, uh, uh, to, to the learning. So um, my, my project was um, around organization change and organization structure in line with growth of an international business. And some of what it led to was um, very significant um, input for me as being what I might call the, 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 the co-pilot of the, uh, the the European CEO in looking at developing that um, that European business from a country uh, kind of fiefdom oriented structure to a more transnational uh, type of organization uh, a more functional organization and, and a much more fluid organization to meet the needs of, of growth and the way the whole world was 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 changing so um, it was it was both part of my personal development, but something I could apply and return to my organisation uh, directly. Mm. But, but but to your point there, um, yes, it takes time. Yes, this programme takes time. Mm. And when I used to um, talk to successive cohorts as the as the chair of the change leaders to be recruiting people into the change leaders, um, I, I used to be a bit provocative, and I used to say. If you're, if if people came with a "what's in it for me" question, I, I turned it round into a "what have you got to offer" type question back to you, and you need to think strongly about having something to offer, as opposed to something that you're going to 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 get. You are absolutely not going to be handed something. There's no magic solution here. There's no spoon feeding. It's down to you to engage in reflective practice. And that's what the Change Leaders is all about. And that, for me, was what Consulting and Coaching for Change was all about. Yeah, I mean, if I just add in there, I mean, I, I think it is interesting thinking about the thesis question there. In a way, um, you know, that program allows you the opportunity to take a puzzle that you have uh, in your own leadership work or change work and begin to apply knowledge to it. So I, I think the thesis is a very good example, Elizabeth, isn't it, of a, of a sort of a different kind of space where a puzzle can be reflected on and knowledge brought in from the course, but also to, to begin to experiment in your own particular context. So I think I've just been thinking about this as you've been talking, John. You know, your, your, the thesis allows you the transposition work opportunity as well, which I think is very interesting. And so yes. I still I, I still remember very well your program on methodology, and how that um, uh, 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 how I recognised then how important methodology was, how having research questions and so on, and and, and what I've now seen you applying here, um, that made a fundamental change to everything that I researched and investigated okay. afterwards, whether it was a thesis or whether it was a problem or whether it was a two-page paper. Um, I've remembered and carried that uh, that experience forward. So it wasn't a one-year program for me. It's been a 12-year and ongoing program, and I still draw on the material. And of course, I can still go to the website and um, uh, and, and the colleagues uh, and yourselves to to take that on. So it's really been a continuous learning, as opposed to a as opposed to a program, I would say. Okay. Yeah. Yes, the continuous learning uh, point is one that, that really means something to me. I certainly didn't expect when I, I stopped being director of the program that I would become secretary of the community of practice. Um, and the, 
the the continuing work there um, is uh, is something which I find um, extremely stimulating. But I think we've got some questions from the audience as well. So Gemma, I think you've got some of those questions that, for us. Um, can I hand back to you to oh. to to deal with those questions absolutely thank you elizabeth and thank you john and sue that was a really interesting discussion and fantastic to hear as you say john that it's been a, a really you know 12 year and i'm sure a lifetime learning experience as well from your experience on the consulting and coaching and change programs so yes we had some fantastic audience um questions but just want to mention quickly unfortunately leslie who we were hoping to speak to today um can't join us unfortunately there's a technical problem with her being able to connect this afternoon um, from um, the States. So I do apologize uh, for that. She was meant to be joining us. She's very apologetic. So, but I know John, you know, covered everything we could have wanted to this afternoon. So thank you, John. That's fantastic. And on to the questions now. Um, this is a question for you really, Sue, and a bit other people, please feel free yeah, to please. chip in. Uh, would you, could you give an example rather of an action learning set and how it works in a particular organization? Sort of a how and what really? Yeah, yeah, no. Um, yeah, so, so, so thank you. So, so, so essentially, I mean, this is a, a methodology that we use actually in the business school as well. Um, essentially what it is, uh, is a opportunity for usually about four people. It can be bigger than that, can be, but usually if you need some variety in it. So, if, so four individuals um, who may be from the same organisation or, or who may not, uh, indeed, the, the work that I was referring to, the research work, we're deliberately creating these action learning sets from different organisations to give more variety. But essentially, it is a, an opportunity for those four individuals, um, usually with a facilitator, um, to explore their own uh, leadership challenges. Um, and how they run, typically, is that uh, there is a big emphasis on asking questions. There's, a, there's, a, there's actually quite a lot. I mean, the, the, the concept of action learning comes from, from Revan's work, but essentially it involves creating a space where people have equal time um, to present a challenge or an issue. And then the responsibility of the rest of the group is to... Uh, ask questions to enable that individual to make progress on their own challenge. Um, so the art of asking questions to try and help the person in the room find a way forward in their own context. So it very much draws on quite a lot of the coaching approaches as well. Um, and as I say, in my experience, it serves as a very confidential sort of space for real uh, learning and reflection and ideally you'd want these action learning sets to not be one-offs in other words they're over time so the individuals will go out and try something and experiment with something and then bring that learning back to the group and again the same methodology of, of asking questions and uh, goes on so I hope that uh, gives you a, a little bit of a, uh, an understanding. But, but John and Elizabeth, you, you may have been involved in action learning sets yourselves. I'm sure you have. Um, is that a fair description? Do you want to add anything on to that? Uh, well, uh, the action learning sets within executive education programs are, 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 are something which um, do, do have an enormous um, impact sometimes, um, and certainly they run within the CCC program. But John, do you see them being very, very similar to a group coaching process, or is an action learning set something different from from group coaching? Um, I think group coaching is probably different because the agenda in group coaching is very often driven. Uh, driven by the group and starts from where the group is, whereas um, an action learning set is perhaps a bit more directed with some sort of premise set at, at, at the start. Yeah. Okay. yeah yes, I mean, uh, one of the things that um, that um, I, I've always thought about the difference between learning and, uh, and teaching uh, and helping people to learn and coaching is coaching does start with the person whereas learning problems start with an issue probably or a, a yeah. question, yeah. Um, question or a subject yeah that's fantastic thank you very much all of you 
Thank you. And, and the next question, this is maybe one for you actually, John, based on your slide. It's um, N Nigel from Bristol. Thank you, Nigel. Hope you're enjoying the webinar. Um, you mentioned disrupted relationships. You said it, you need to be uncomfortable and receptive to impose change. Do you think that's true for the vast majority of people working in change, or is it something that kind of you have to grow and develop as you're um, going through your career? Mm, mm. Um, I, I'm, sure it, I'm sure it grows and develops. Um, I, I'm sure that um, I have changed considerably in in my approach to change, and it's probably in this area that um, I've come to appreciate context much more. Um, I've come to appreciate um, uh, moving away from standard models. Um, and this would be another CCC thing that it's not about um, this model or that model or the SE's model or the Grow model or anything else that you've that, that you've that you've heard of. Um, and, and this is where discomfort starts to come in. That when you try to go beyond the models and really engage and work with the client on the on the issue, and try to do that in the moment. Um, it's, it's much more challenging and I think it's a different level for either a change agent or a coach to be able to, to do that. I'm not sure if that touches the, the question, but that's the immediate thought. That's fantastic. Thank you very much, John. That really helps. Um, the next question is from Mark Clark. And said, Sue mentioned new knowledge inquiries tend to be most about performance management and productivity and quality. Does this mean that new knowledge generation tends to remain at what Argus um, would call single loop learning rather than double loop learning? And what could be done to support double loop learning or even triple loop learning? <laughs> <laughs> Just to add on to it, um, learning about processes of learning. Yeah, that's a really good question. Okay, so, so uh, let's think a bit about that because I didn't say very much uh, about that. I mean, you know, in addition to the work of knowledge leaders in, in terms of getting knowledge into practice, um, if you're really going to get that richness of learning that you're alluding to by your question, it has to be supported also by an organizational architecture, by which I mean incentives, training and development. Um, you know, it's not just something an individual can do just on their own. So to really get that quality of learning that you're referring to, you know, knowledge leaders also have to work on creating an environment or a context where uh, it's easy for people to engage uh, with this knowledge and, and engage with learning and engage with change and, and positive outcomes. So, um, you know, you're right to pick me up on that in the sense that we also need to make sure that incentives are there, that training and development are there, that a language uh, is around that can support um, the kinds of intentions of the change as well. So to get that deep, rich learning, you're absolutely right. It cannot be just the work of an individual. It has to be a system that really begins to support and um, and be agile enough that um, you know as new knowledge comes in, that can also be used. So great question. I, th I, th I think this is John. I think the question also um, touches on the fact that in this in this program we attract thought leaders, yeah. and as the change leaders, we attract thought leaders. So we had the privilege of having Chris Arjaris in person to uh, explain that to yeah. us in uh, in 2005. Um, and you know, another example would be just recently in the change leaders, we had Margaret Wheatley, who. Um, uh, uh, big organisations would have a trouble to attract someone of that calibre to come and spend a day with them, and we, as an alumni uh, program, could bring her in for for a day. I'm sure, you know, in his day, we would have been able to bring our Jairus in. But the point is about really high calibre leading thinkers and being able to explore their work uh, directly and get the answer to that question directly, rather than from uh, from someone else's interpretation. Is has been a fantastic part of that uh, that program over the years. Very good. Why, why, why is it, John, do you think that people will believe or, or are more interested in hearing somebody speak to them uh, rather than reading their book? Mm, mm. Um, you get more of a uh, person, I suppose. Do you see the authenticity where, where somebody's coming from? 
Well, yeah. we just saw in we saw in Sue's research, didn't we, that 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 people have limited time for reading, and certainly in organisations, they do, or we just lose the habit of reading. Yeah. And yet we want it served up in a way that's understandable to us. Yeah. Um, but I found that then stimulated me to go and go and read the books that I wouldn't have otherwise got to or I wouldn't have otherwise related to without having interacted over them and discussed them with a peer group um, and then actually worked with people in practice you know from the alumni group actually working um, with in organizations applying some of this stuff and sharing a common language um, that was enabling us to uh, uh, to do that um, I think that's that's been a big benefit for me yeah, I also think, Elizabeth, it is the authenticity and so forth. But, but with somebody like, you know, um, Margaret Wheatley, I mean, you, what you've got there is 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 a synthesis of, of, of knowledge of the field, of the scholarly field, but also you've got knowledge of her, her uh, of the experiences of trying to apply that. And, 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 and so to have that in an individual <laughs> and be able to interrogate and, and discuss, you know, those, those kind of crucible moments of that career in trying to get the scholarly stuff into practice fantastic mm, mm. well I guess you've got some more questions absolutely thank you Elizabeth and I'm, I'm really pleased to say that Leslie's now managed to overcome um, technical oh. difficulties I hope Leslie can hear me can you hear me Leslie I can can you hear me uh, you're a little bit quiet if you could turn the volume up a tiny bit that would be fantastic thank you all right how's that Perfect. Thank you so much. And I'm delighted you can join us. I'm sorry that we had problems with you connecting earlier. And I'm sorry to the audience as well, kind of changing the order slightly of, uh, uh, say, adapting to change, which is a, an excellent uh, approach anyway. So I'm going to go now onto your slides, Leslie, so you can share your experiences, because I know you've had a very interesting, very career um, pre-CCC programme and post the programme. So your thoughts on that would be fantastic to hear them. And then we'll take a couple more questions right at the very end. And then the remainder of the questions, we'll make sure when we do the follow up, with all the slides and the recording, um, that everybody can have an answer to the questions posed um, and sent to you next week. So without further ado, I'm just going to pass you your slides over now. Leslie, bear with me a moment. Fire away. Okay, well, this is just a little bit about me. Um, I have been an external management consultant focusing on human dynamics for about 25 years now and uh, was in John's class at CCC. So when I came into the course, I was already in the field and had been working primarily in intervening as an executive coach uh, for individuals. And, and, and I also do a lot of high performance team coaching now. So um, I think that I, I'm sorry I missed the comments before, so I hope I'm not off point or redundant, but um, I've thought a lot about Sue's research and my experiences with the application of management research in organizations. And I think, and I'll speak primarily from an American point of view. I don't know if there are real cultural differences, but there may be. Um, I think. In what I see in the U.S., and I work, I tend to work at the top of the house in organizations. I don't do as much pure organization development where I'm working uh, directly with an entire organization. But I think there is in the U.S. a lot of interest in what's kind of the shiny and new thing. That and that shows up in uh, the popular press books that are published through. Harvard and and Oxford, but uh, a lot of times I see CEOs reading the latest books, and what I what I notice is that people get very interested in the latest or newest thing, but they but application is much more difficult if they haven't been in a um, if they haven't had an academic background where they've really had to uh, work on research and applying that knowledge, which many of them haven't. Um, even if they have MBAs, it's not quite the same kind of thing. They um, tend not to have a lot of trouble having being able to apply anything. And so I have found, and maybe that's just my own bias because I am an external consultant, but I have found that uh, one role that I've played is being a translator and an interpreter of that 
knowledge and that uh, management research into a more practical application set. So I do think that that's a big focus for external consultants. And I think that to get any kind of um, application and interest, it's always in um, solution to a current problem, something the way I use management research effectively, and, and I love having that research, is uh, looking at what's out there in the research when I am seeing an organization deal with a current problem. And sometimes they're dealing with a problem then they haven't asked me yet to work on it, but because I'm working at the top of the house, I may propose some ideas, not necessarily work for me to do, but just talk with them about some practical things that flow from management research that I've done. Uh, not that I haven't done the seminal research, but that I've reviewed. Um, I do think that adoption in organizations requires um, translation and a way to apply things practically. So I think that that's a, a critical role for internal or external change agents trying to um, make a difference. And I know that that uh, aligns with Sue's research. And I do think that I, I know my, in my experience on the disruption of relationships and kind of the status quo question, any use of research by anybody, internal or external, does require a, a, a strategic approach. I think just showing up and announcing, hey, here's the newest, latest thing, and we're doing it all wrong, and this is how it ought to be done, without some st strategy, without maybe uh, socializing it among a few people and getting some champions and allies. Uh, if, without doing that, there can be that disruption factor. Um, Thank you, Leslie. That's fantastic. And um, I'm so glad you could join us. It's really interesting to hear your viewpoints on that. And we'll, we've only unfortunately got a couple of minutes left, but I wanted to put to Sue and Elizabeth and John, if you have any questions of Leslie, of her, what she said today, um, just for the last couple of minutes, and then we'll wrap up. And then the audience as well, so you know the questions you have asked. If we haven't got to them, I will make sure you get full answers to those um, in the subsequent email next week. So over to the panel. Well, I was intrigued by your comment, Leslie, that there might be cultural differences in this. Uh, and um, would you would you enlarge on that a bit, or is it something we all need to think about, or do you do you have some some more thoughts on it? Well, it's complete. It's that's completely an hypothesis. Um, I just know that what I see is, uh, at least here, there's. There's all, you know, we're a very marketing-based, self-promotion-based culture in the U.S., so there's a lot of promotion of, you know, the newest book by, um, you know, somebody really important and, uh, you know, from Harvard or whatever. And so people, there is, because there's so much promotion of those things, at least in this country, it's all over the place, people pick those things up and, and may read them, uh, CEO types at the top of the house usually, you know, they're in an organization like Young President's organization or some of these things where they hear these people speak and they get very yeah. excited, they run back to the organization and say, hey, here's the newest, latest thing and everybody else kind of looks at them and scratches their head and thinks, well, what do we do with that? So. so, so how did you, as an American, how did you find coming on a European program like CCC? Oh, well, it was fantastic. Did you find it very European? Mm -hmm. um, no, but I did find people had, uh, the non-Americans had a lot of ideas about Americans and they wanted to find out what was true or not, but I did, I did get that perspective that we are a very promotional-based culture. Um, probably more so than some of the Europeans. Mm. <laughs> Intriguing. We're self-promoting, let me put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And um, just um, we're just coming to the one o'clock now. But John, did you have any questions at all for Leslie before we close? Um, no, thank you. 
Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, so the final slide um, on the screen is a uh, roundup, really, of the uh, dates for the next programme, which is starting the Consulting Coaching for Change, which is starting on the 8th of December, um, as Andy said earlier in the webinar. And the programme fee is there, along with the uh, contact details for Anders, who is our counterpart over in Paris, who manages the recruitment discussions. Um, and we work very much in tandem. So I'll be putting on the email that comes out to you next week, Andy's contact details as well, um, so that you can um, contact him if you wish to have ask any questions. Um, as I say, we'll have the full recording and the slides of the webinar. We had so many questions, which is absolutely fantastic. I'm delighted that you're all so engaged and sort of raring to go. So those that we haven't got to, um, apologies, and we will be answering those questions in full in an email to you. Um, and lastly, just thank you so much for everybody for joining us. Thank you to Elizabeth, John, Leslie, and Sue, and Andy um, for your time and support um, on this webinar. And I hope you all have a very pleasant afternoon and a pleasant week weekend. Best wishes. Bye. Thank you, Jill. Bye-bye. Goodbye, everybody. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye.